بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Hello and welcome It's so nice to see so many familiar faces and new friends coming to support us here in London My name is Dr. Lemise Hamdan for those who don't know and I'm the Commissioner of the National Pavilion for the United Arab Emirates in the 2013 International Art Exhibition La Biennale di Venezia On behalf of the National Pavilion, thank you for coming Since our inception, we've always been under the umbrella of the Ministry of Culture, Youth and Community Development. I am pleased to announce the UAE's third participation at the 55th International Art Exhibition, La Biennale di Venezia, from June 1st to November 24th, 2013. This year, we are grateful to have the support of the Sheikha Salama bin Hamdan al Nhayan Foundation. The Foundation's motto is, investing in the future of the UAE by investing in its people. It works to contribute to the creation of positive futures for the citizens of the United Arab Emirates and the full realization of their potentials and aspirations. To that end, it develops and supports charitable initiatives in the areas of education, arts, culture, heritage, and the environment. The foundation is the family foundation of Sheikh Salama bin Hamdan al Nhayan and was founded by her in 2010. In 2009, as you know, the UAE was the first Gulf country to participate at the Venice Biennale. This year, for our third participation, Mohammed Kalam has been selected for a solo presentation at our national pavilion. Mohammed Kalam was born in Dubai in 1969. It is here that he first studied fine art at the Emirates Fine Arts Society. He went on to learn music, attend national and international art workshops, as well as teach painting at Dubai Art Atelier with Hassan Sharif. Kadhim's works have been selected for biennales and exhibitions around the world for over two decades, including Holland, Singapore, Germany, Switzerland, Egypt, Lebanon, Bangladesh, India, Spain, Japan, the USA, Uzbekistan, Russia, and Cuba. He has taken part in several Sharjah International Art Biennales and has been awarded first prize for installation. Kadhim went on to curate the 8th Sharjah Biennale in 2007. Since then, he was the curator of the Flying House from 2007 to 2011, and while simultaneously curating exhibitions in Spain, Switzerland, and in the UAE. Kadhim has now opened his own studio, MT10, in El Goz, Dubai, in 2012. Mohammed is currently an MFA candidate at the University of Arts in Philadelphia, USA, where he will finish the degree in December 2012. I am pleased to introduce Reem Fadla, our curator for the 2013 UAE Pavilion. Reem Fadda is currently working as Associate Curator of Middle Eastern Art for the Abu Dhabi Project at the Solomon R. Guggenheim Foundation based in New York. She is also a PhD candidate at the History of Art and Visual Studies Department at Cornell University. Between 2005 and 2007, Fadda, <coughs> excuse me, Fadda was Director of the Palestinian Association for Contemporary Art and worked as academic director to the International Academy of Art, Palestine, which she helped found in 2006. She co-curated and has been involved in many projects, such as Liminal Spaces, a four-year-long artistic political project consisting of conferences, tours, art residencies, and exhibitions. The Ramallah Syndrome, a project showcased at the 53rd Venice Biennale, Terjama Translation, which was an Art East program showcasing 30 artists from the Middle East and Central Asia at the Queen's Museum and Herbert E. Johnson Museum, and the third Riwaq Biennale, which she curated alongside Charles Esch in Ramallah. Do I keep saying his name wrong? No. Okay. She is a member of the General Assembly of both the International Academy of Art and the Qamadjani Association, the selection jury of the Young Arab Theatre Fund, and the steering committee of decolonizing architecture. Reem now is going to present a talk along with Mohammed Kadam. So please help me in introducing, in welcoming her. Um, hello, everyone. It's very good to speak to a room of people that I know. Um, 
Uh, I'm very happy to be here with all of you today, and uh, I hope I can shed the light um, on the artistic scene in the United Arab Emirates, but also, most importantly, the work of Mohammed Kazem and how it's situated within that sphere and uh, spectrum. Um, I talk a lot, so uh, I apologize if this is going to extend in any way possible. I'll try to be good with time. Um, and uh, the way I've structured this talk is that I will give uh, a brief kind of a, a, a recount of what is the framework of the scene in the UAE, uh, just so that people start to be acquainted uh, with artists, the infrastructure, how it's situated within that kind of um, cultural fabric and scene. And then I'm going to showcase the work of um, uh, a little bit of Hassan Sharif uh, as a sort of anchor artist and a reference that is very important to see then uh, the work of Muhammad Kazem and to have you, uh, to acquaint you with that um, visual vocabulary of the practice of both of these artists. Um, so basically to start, um, uh, and, and I, I do have to say that the PowerPoint will only finish after my first introduction. Um, and then we're gonna dim the room, so please don't fade away with the, with the dimming of the lights. Um, I hope I'll make it interesting that it doesn't go that way. Um, so I, just to kind of think about um, the scene in the UAE, and this is something that I was always really grappling with, I constantly hear the, the message that everything's new, the boom, Dubai, it's all 10 years old. And for me, that is something that I um, very much would like to, ref to really create an argument of a refutation, that there is no such thing. Um, nothing is new, and there is a history for a place. Uh, and histories of places don't start with their national bring, uh, upbringing, basically. Countries don't start only with the announcement of their nationalization. Um, and, that's, and the UAE is not an exception to that case. Culture and arts goes way before that, and it has its roots anchored within a larger vocabulary. So having that in mind, you know, tracing back the references, for example, I was able, the first kind of thing that is very important is to go back and see what are the strengths. Maybe visual arts in the, in the spectrum that we know of is not the anchor of how to understand where, where that cultural sphere it was most active. And of course we know that poetry is actually a very strong reference to the culture of the UAE and the Arab world generally. So for example, I found out about this um, fantastic uh, po poet, Salem uh, bin Ali Al-Awais, who not only wrote, but wrote from the early century and was very much an active member um, in, uh, in a poetic community and was uh, regionally quite active. So he knew a lot about the Arab world, the Palestinian cause, Balfour Declaration. He was very much involved in all of these uh, political even uh, uprisings that were happening of the region and recounted it in his poetry. So this was like going back really early on in the century and seeing those kind of cultural references. There was also a poetry movement that happened in 1940s uh, in Sharjah, which was called Al Hira Group, which was also a fantastic kind of lead to see how that really ties in. Now, I think why we started to see a much more strategic kind of reference for the visual arts and the narrative is of course it is associated with the modernization of the and the modernization and establishment of the nation um, but and this is the, the question that we start to ask ourselves is so why didn't why didn't it happen before and the reason of course is we have to understand that uh, the UAE was also hampered by being under British rule at the time, very appropriately said during the v in the VNA, but that's the reality and the truth. And therefore, the modernization process was not it was not advocated for, it did not move forward in the way it should have happened. The boom of oil helped accelerate it in a much uh, in a, a very targeted kind of way. So we started to see uh, the definite kind of uh, building up of frameworks started up by the state, um, patronage really uh, anchored by the government in, uh, in a very strategic kind of way. So for example, one of the first recorded um, uh, exhibition was in 1971, which is the date of the founding of the UAE. So this is just to show an example that 
the framework needed to happen in order to activate what was already there in the scene. So in 1971, they, they created a big exhibition of young talent and, and artists, um, and they showcased, showcased that in a group kind of format. Um, and that was in the general library in Dubai. Um, and actually, another kind of really important thing is to think about the, just, the general growth that is happening um, in relation to the region. So what we really don't, uh, uh, we don't know about is how, if we see a cohesive history that ties in the Arab world and the culture and arts from the entire region together, and that was the case before we had issues of visa and travel and movement, then you start to understand that there was something that the Gulf really helped do quite uh, evidently and most importantly, starting with places like Kuwait, Saudi Arabia at an earlier date and also the UAE from the 70s onwards, which has helped provide for a stable and safe kind of haven for the nurturing of arts from other places in the Arab world that had started to suffer from um, uh, consequences of unfortunate circumstances of war, et cetera, and strife that was happening elsewhere. So this is a very kind of important thing to um, pass on in terms of the role of the Gulf and how it really helped do that. Um, so again, we're saying that there is this development of uh, within this modern new formed state, you started to see curriculum, uh, the building of institutions, of course, uh, scholarships, uh, uh, you know, in a much more systematic way. And it's very interesting to, to find out, even to this day, that the government actually subsidizes scholarships for pretty much everyone, and specifically artists. So all the artists that I will mention, and everywhere they've studied, is actually a subsidy and a support that is given by the state to these artists. So this is something that is very important and central to really understand how much this framework is, um, is active and, and important. So some of the uh, other ways that um, the state was really active was to help the artist go into the Arab region and support them within you know, festivals that are happening in the region. For example, um, Emirati artists were seen in the Arab arts festivals that in Algeria in 1973, in Baghdad in 77, in Rabat in 79, 81 in Damascus, Riyadh in 83. So it's the, dynam the dynamic nature of how much there is integration in the arts, and these are, of course, sample, um, uh, uh, sample activities. There's much more. Um, so it's, it's a much more vibrant scene than we know of from the 70s onwards. Um, there is also um, an annual young artist exhibition that uh, started in 1975 by the state in the UAE, and the first edition started with 34 artists. Um, and of course, again, as we said, a lot of scholarships started to be given to many of the artists. And some of the most, tying back to like the idea of how the region was very tied in with um, uh, the art scene in the UAE, uh, we know of the influences of so many artists, like Shakir Hassan Al Said, who is an Iraqi artist, theorist, very important thinker, and one of the founders and activators of al-Hurufiya, which is letterism, um, and, and that was an uh, advocating kind of form of painting and the use of the Arabic letter in the painting. And I think the discourse that Shakir Hassan al-Said really raised, he formed an, an important modernist art group in 1971 called the One Dimension Group. And this and he created a manifesto which was published and was circulated also in the Emirates. There was a wide discourse that was happening that is on such a sophisticated scale, thinking about philosophy, uh, epistemologies of existentialism, phenomenology, uh, real thinking about materiality, all of that and how that vocabulary starts to, to appear in the painting. Imagine that kind of discourse also seeping into the scene in the UAE, but not just wide kind of discourse that is happening in the region. And many of the artists that are going to study in Iraq or going to study in, uh, in Egypt, like for example, Najat Makki studies in Egypt, we have Abdurrahim Salem studying in Egypt, or others that are going to the US and the UK, like the, the instance of Hassan Sharif who's going to the UK. So you start to have all of these elements coming from everywhere particularly from the region, but also internationally, and really boiling in the UAE on, in, in, a, in a very concentrated way. Uh, but some of the regional artists who were there, who were quite influential, 
as I mentioned, Shakir Hassan, uh, Dia Azawi, also Iraqi. Fay Hassan is also very, very important to the idea of the vocabulary of the realist, folk realism that starts to appear in many of the paintings in the UAE. Um, Ismail Shammut, uh, you have that very also social realist painting dealing with the political uh, plight of the Palestinians, but also that very immediate language that start that people really relate to and how they translated you see a lot of young artists in the uae painting or drawing folk scenes tradition uh, referring to falconry in their imagery it really starts to um uh, really starts to uh build up in that kind of way abdel qadir al uh, 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 oscillates between you know doing calligraphic abstraction at one point and then moving on to scenic village, villagery. So it's, it's very interesting to see the debate between abstraction and figuration that is happening everywhere in the region and particularly also in the UA, UAE. Um, Asad Urabi, Yasser Dwek, who resides in the UAE and um, of Palestinian origin and, and, and is teaching there. Fatih Mudarris, who attends several festivals, Sharjah Biennials, uh, exhibitions, and is very much coming to the UAE constantly and who is obviously not just one of the kind of founding figures of modernist painting in Syria, very important figure across the region generally. Uh, and Abdul, uh, Abdul Latif Asmoudi, who, who helped actually open the road in Sharjah for a lot of these regional artists to actually come in uh, to the scene. Um, now, if I wanted to name who are the names of what would we call the first generation of artists post independence from the UAE that started to really um, shine out. Who were the names? Uh, and I have to say that a lot of the sources that I, uh, that I have uh, received uh, from interviews, either from my discussions with Mohammed Kalam or discussions with Hassan Sharif, or a fabulous book which is called In the Light and Shadow by Adil Khuzam, a writer from the UAE who charts this magnificent kind of history in a very um, uh, very descriptive, but also uh, a lot of uh, a lot of information is provided in this book, uh, and articles that he's provided on that. So that that kind of first generation, I would say, is uh, the names would be Muhammad Yusuf, Ibrahim Mustafa, Hassan Sharif, Hamad Liswedi, uh, Abdul Qadir Al Rais, Abdul Rahim Salem, Abed Sroor, Abdul Rahman uh, Zainal, Muhammad Al Mandi, Hussein Sharif, Fatma Luta, Najat Makki. Hisham al Mazlum, Thuraya Amin, Ahmed al Ansari, Wafa al Sabah, Shafiq Ibrahim Abbas, Muhammad al Qassab, Usalih al Ustad, Umuna al Khaja, Usalim al Mas. The second tier generation, which comes after and is a fantastic kind of dynamic, is of which Muhammad Kadam is really part of that second generation, um, and others like Abdullah Saadi, Tariq al Hussein. Uh, Muhammad Ahmed Ibrahim, Ibtisam Abdul Aziz, Layla Jum'a, Huda Saeed, Muna Abdul Qadir. And of course, the even younger generation, such as Rim Al Ghaif and uh, Lamis and uh, Lamia Sari Gargaj, and others that are start to really the, the scene as we know it today. But I think it's, it's interesting to see how many generations has already gone through um, the development in the scene. Now, the really important infrastructure that formed itself and formed alliances in the UAE, most importantly is the Emirates Arts Society that was formed in 1980. And it did several exhibitions, and, um, uh, and apart from its exhibitions, it provided for art ateliers where Hassan and Muhammad actually met. So it provided for alternative education in the art scene. And that is a very important kind of moment. Um, these art ateliers, um, they were, um, they had their curricular structure, but they most importantly allowed for an inter interaction between artists and young practitioners. Muhammad Kazim did not finish school. As in the age of 14, decides to attend the art ateliers. He finds Hassan Sharif, who had just come back from London, who was very active with his own community and peers, creating his own kind of, um, if you want, avant-garde, progressive, artistic group, um, alternative in their scene, creating performances, thinking about arts in a very different way. Now, all of the references that we heard before, how does it all come together? Hassan is a very uh, stringent critic of letterism. 
He's like, I'm anti-letterism. And I think this is a very important thing because only if you have a developed discourse that is about painting, letterism, etc., how would you voice your opinions about a different kind of dynamic, a different kind of articulation of a history and identity? And I think it's very important to see the modernization of that country is happening at the same time. And an international language is also happening at the same time. He's bringing a, a, a colossal kind of information together, and he mixes them up in a, in a very interesting way. And this is how he starts to develop his own vocabulary of an artistic practice. And this is where he starts to give this practice um, uh, um, uh, that very is very contemporary and very, and very, um, um, very, in, uh, touch very in touch with the society, with the society. Um, very, um, very new, introducing, introducing new media. The painting is, the no, painting longer is no longer enough. enough. So, performance so performance is a very big, thing. A very big and thing. And he even really starts to redefine vocabulary, vocabulary of what is artistic, artistic practice. So, uh, for example, um, for example drawings, drawings are no longer drawings. drawings. They're, based They're based on a very sophisticated way of thinking that he's come up with, which is called semi-systems and we'll discuss them with the images. Um, objects, are, sculptures are no longer sculptures, they're objects, because they, they really are emphasizing the materiality that he deals with things. Um, and so it's very interesting to see how these things are developing. The relationship between Muhammad and Hassan is absolutely fascinating. Since the age of 14, and I'm not mistaken, they meet nearly every day. If they're in the same country, there's an interaction between Hassan and Muhammad on a daily basis. And I think that's such an important thing to see. Um, and I think it's also very interesting that as much as he nurtured him, and Hassan was a great mentor for someone like Muhammad, but Muhammad is his own person in terms of his own artistic practice and career. Where Hassan is the fantastic theorist and thinker, Muhammad is the formalist. And he thinks on a, on a, on a stronger, uh, formal level, and I would say um, also advocates for different kind of usage of media. So you have a very different dynamic already starting within that scene, just with comparing two artists and two generations of artists. But their relationship, I think, of their relationship to the society, to the building of the nation, are something that is very intrinsic to how they were looking at their art and dealing with it. Space, nature, uh, Urbanity. These are very important notions in the making of the of the work of both of these artists. Um, so I'm just going to go through really straightforward to the PowerPoint. Here we are with our title. Um, so we're starting with the work of Hassan Sharif, and I'm I hopefully will not take a long time to um, uh, just discuss the work, but basically here you see. Uh, very much documentation of some of his performances, which he did as early as 1979 here. And you see this work where he does fingerprinting on paper, basically, uh, in, a, in an action, uh, in a uh, very much, uh, um, uh, let's say, intrinsic action of the use of the thumb. Um, and here, jumping. And I'll explain. And here, walking in the desert, as you see in the landscape of Hatta Dubai, he's just walking in an open field. And people who actually document him are his kind of own crew of people. Here you see some images involving other people as well. Sound of the act, um, which here, as you see, he's just photo documenting himself drinking, eating, and the sound element is added up as a reference to the work. And these are only, what, we re, what remains with us today is all, only these photo documentations of the work. So that is all that is left. For example, the recording on this work is, is not with us. Um, these are things in my room, just things that are available in his room, and he just photo documents it. Before I go into the sculptural work, what are we looking at when we're looking at these performances? Simple photography of daily life, what does that mean? What it means is that he's starting to think really about a very important, uh, I would say, uh, even um, existentialist kind of thinking. He's thinking, what are the basic usages of even the most uh, benign things in our lives and around us? What makes us who we are, um, not just as people? Uh, what if, I, if he wanted to deconstruct the surroundings and the life 
of people, what would it look like? The situation of things. If he wanted to, um, for example, it's very important in the, in, in the mind of Hassan Sharif, this idea that things are not working on a system. And I think this very idea that things are not working in a system is crucial to life because Nothing works in a system. And I think this is very important in terms of like thinking on, uh, on a phenomen phenomenological level, thinking about the use of the body, all the, the appearances of all the elements that surround people and societies together and make the complexity of narrative. So what he's trying to do is deconstruct the most simple elements in life to shed them as very complicated placements of narrative that make up these, uh, th these lives. So he also insists on randomness. He loves the idea of the random. So uh, this is something that constantly comes back. He wants you to look at things that are random because I think it's also very important to highlight, when you highlight things that are very, um, let's say, benign or mediocre, you only emphasize the importance of life. And I think this is the kind of sim most simple way that I could explain it. So if if a piece of, if you have the time to reflect on a clock or, um, or a book or a shoe, then how much more is your life worth? Because it, it kind of, it, there's more level for critical thinking and, 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 and the advoca advocacy for thought provoking in terms of looking in an introverted way towards your own life and what makes our life around us. So going back to his performances, these things, just the sound, how much could you concentrate in thinking how much sound is important in the element that surrounds us and in these daily benign activities? Um, walking in the desert, this idea of open space, the interrogation of space is such an important and crucial element to the thinking of uh, Hassan Sharif, how it affects the body, where the body is located, vision, how you put all of these elements together. Uh, the desert as a location becomes something of, uh, something of an inspiration for Hassan. He does so many works and performances in the desert. And again, this kind of, you know, the movement uh, and, and capturing that in that level of, um, uh, you know, in that kind of momentary, temporal even aspect. So, and then of course, the another very important dimension, here we saw the performances and, uh, and, and the, the capturing of the, these images are part of his experiments. Um, and then Wire, this is his first kind of, um, what we have of a constellation of his cultural works that he calls objects, is another emphasis on the importance of materiality in his art practice. The material makes up the thinking of how an artist really survives by, by intuitively understanding the material and things that are surrounding him. Um, Hassan obsessively deals with the material. Um, he looks at things and they relate to him and they kind of speak to him in, in their own language. So he's creating these vocabulary of masses of materials of what people might think of as waste or whatever, but it's not. He's looking at things that constitute um, narratives in their own right, in their own locale, and then creating structures of their own and their own formal qualities that speak back to you as an artist. And here is semi-systems, which is a little bit complicated. So if we want to think about a lot of the elements that we talked about, um, uh, for example, his uh, semi-systems are thinking about the fact that there is no system, the, the fact that the grid can be random, the fact that um, even the most mathematical of ideas could also be factored on randomness. For example, some of his ideas were based on a dictionary, where he does not read the dictionary as an alphabet from A to Z. He actually goes randomly to a page, 367, adds the, letter, uh, adds the numbers together, 367 add up to, I don't know how much, but, and then he'll count the numbers to a random word. He reaches to the word and he circles the word, and that's it. And that kind of level of random act is, is highlighted in that moment by an artist in a documented kind of performance. What does that mean? It means it becomes codex of drawings that he creates that look like this in the end, which I find to be quite interesting. If the guidance of the visual thinking 
and the element of even the three-dimensionality that starts to come up with the bar here has references to language. Language is a, one of the most intrinsic kind of systems that are acknowledged by everyone in the world, historically. And how that has such a deep intuitive level, and that added layer is added to even more layers of a random act by an artist, and then this is transformed into a grid, and the grid is transformed into an image that is a drawing, but which he calls a semi-system. So this is sort of in really trying to summarize some of the practice of the important kind of practice of Hassan Sharif in not so many words, and this is a further display of an installation view of Hassan's work. Um, now to our artist, Mohamed Kazem, who, as we said, has this very important relationship with uh, Hassan and is chosen for the biennial for very good reason, because he has a career that starts you don't know when it starts if we're thinking on a semi-system level, which is no beginnings and no ends, and, and not anything that is divided only by a BA or an MA or any kind of qualifications in that kind of order, um, that is really decided by a level of building up your intuition and knowledge from multiple ways and thinking, and an openness, which is, quite very, is very important both to the career of Hassan and Mohammed. Here, experiment. So very much the language that still is used by Hassan and also translates to Muhammad with this work that is on paper. And this is something that I just want to highlight from the very beginning, where, where Muhammad really, again, excels is his formalist abilities. He thinks on a different level from what Hassan was capable of doing. And I think he thinks on a much more, um, if you want, clean cut, formalist language, uh, that, has, um, that has installation, that has new media. You'll start to see light. You'll start, start to see photography. You will start to see in color. Um, you will start to see um, uh, a different kind of imagery really emanating from an artist that is looking at a different way of articulating his ideas. This is, for example, um, again, keyboard that he does in 1995. I have a fabulous image of him actually meticulously working on his... And I want to say this about Muhammad. I've not seen such a diligent kind of working artist who has their own kind of schedule. They think he does everything with his own kind of uh, way. Uh, he has his own program every morning. Uh, I find it really admirable because working on such a tight schedule, self-organizing yourself in that kind of capacity as an artist, we know how difficult that is. And he really masters it quite well. And I think the upbringing, the fact that he's been doing art since he was 14, and he doesn't understand another language of practice, of, uh, of doing, except by being an artist, is also quite fascinating. He's 44 now, so eligible. Um, uh, in this performance, for example, Tongue, um, very much we can see these, the daily routines, the ideas that were really very much in very, uh, uh, very articulated with uh, Hassan's work, but even more with uh, Muhammad's reference on the body. Muhammad and him, his self-portraiture is an extremely important element throughout his work. His situation of his body, how he uses himself in relation to things is something that is a very important dimension in understanding his work. So it's very interesting to see these bodily gestures and again, their relation to the materiality around him the objects that are around him. We are no longer looking at images that are far away from you, as in the Hassan's work, we're looking at them actually touching, your, touching his body and becoming part of his own experience. So experientiality is another important element in, ha in uh, Muhammad's work. The idea of the experiential. For example, I've had discussions with him where he's saying, but I want to be able to see sound. And I'm like, how do you see sound? Um, or I want the light to be three-dimensional. And I am thinking, how do you do that? So it's, there is a level of the experiential where he wants that added level of how you see and experience things to start to have a material visual look. So this is what we really start to see the development of in his, throughout his career. Again, one of his performances, autobiography, see very clear kind of articulation of the self here. Um, not just making movements, for example, as in the case of Hassan. This is a clear self-referential way of identifying his work. So just poses of him 
working with his legs and, and, and feet. And I know it sounds, I know it looks like awkward, but it's like, it's very interesting to see this kind of level of work in the, in the situation of a region that this kind of vocabulary is, is really new to this idea of performances. Actually, it's very interesting that Khalil Rabah, the Palestinian uh, conceptual artist, was doing quite similar performances as well in a different zone. Uh, that were also the usage of the body started to really uh, appear in his work and with a very similar aesthetic. So it's very interesting to see how these uh, uh, artistic practices simultaneously start to work in the same ways. Um, this is one of my favorite kind of performances because he's using a sculptural ladder-like work, but he creates this compartment where box is actually the height of his head and it only can fit his head, but he does it that the entire um, sphere of that sort of ladder shelf-like uh, structure is actually his height as well. So he tries to compartmentalize himself in different kind of, in this kind of structural uh, element that we have there. Very conceptual and very, um, very performative in, in the way he does it. The photo documentation is then inserted on the edges of, the, of this shelf. So, and then you have a structure that lives as a living documentation of this act and um, of the gesture. Notice that a lot of his work is situated again outside. So again, the reference to Hassan, the desert, um, place, space, um, these are very important elements. What you clearly see a push forward in the work of Muhammad Kazim is urbanity. He really thinks of the people how, what makes these people, what makes these cities, how, how are they defined, how, what do they look like, and where he, his own person, stands from all of these elements. So, for example, in the photographs with flags, this is a project he worked on from 97 to 2003. And then this is another important element where his projects are long. So the, he takes time, and time for him is an important kind of process. So. Um, they, they take time in their development. Uh, it's a long um, history. He goes back to the idea back and forth and creates different visual elements that show this work. So flags, the series, is where he's standing with these flags, opposing uh, structures that are being built in Dubai and, and in other places around the UAE. And they're from different times, and you'll see just through the photographic images the kind of level of how much time and different kind of language that you start to see. This image was used for the uh, Charge of Biennial in 2003 as uh, the poster image and was really quite iconic and became quite well known as part of the flag series. Windows, which is in 2003 to 2005, but a continuation to what we saw in the flag series, him being situated in these like urban environments, um, in these surrounding elements, very in a desolate kind of form, looking out of windows. Again, this was also something that was featured in the Sharjah Biennial. Looking at the urbanity of the city, the witness, the evidence, what are we seeing? The workers, the people, the material elements that make up this society and make up this framework. And again, windows. And from windows, he does space. So now it becomes even, and, and here I just want to be able to show how much of his vocabulary, I mean, I, I don't have enough time or images to show you, um, for example, that he's developed them in light boxes, he's developed them in so many shapes and forms, visually and materially. So this is just a level of how much he's sophisticated, even in thinking about what are the materials. How is this project going to be portrayed? And he does everything to the very kind of last details. Now, for example, he's working on windows again in a beautiful, um, in these beautiful drawings, these uh, uh, sort of um, uh, transfer on paper drawings that he created over um, 100 drawings from images and locales in around the UAE. As we can see here, the Tower of Khalifa Tower. And then the other very important project is directions, which he was doing simultaneously. So I just want you to think about the level of pro prolific kind of nature of this artist and how much he was doing so many important kind of conceptual projects simultaneously. So in 2000 and 2001, he embarks on a project that he still is working on to this day, 
um, which is called Directions, which he thinks about the situation of himself, and he uses a GPS. So again, this idea of like incorporation of new media. He takes a GPS and puts it in random locations. The randomness of Hassan Sharif is translating into a different form of like this kind of uh, the global nature, how these new medias are um, really translating themselves. He puts them in various locations in the UAE. This very sophisticated kind of uh, installation is we see four different markers. And these are, sorry, I don't have a close-up image, but they're actually filled, the, the letters are filled with sand or soil from the different locations. So the materiality, nature, urbanity, they start to come in in a different formal vocabulary that we're looking at here. And then this one, he does something completely different. And I, having seen the documentation images is really fascinating to see because he does it with Hassan. Um, Hassan um, kan ma'ak kaman wahed? Um, Muhammad Ahmed. So Hassan and Muhammad Ahmed actually accompany him. They go to this like journey to do this performance work. So he's going back to performativity as well in his documentation. And he creates these four plaques that he writes, GP, uh, four wooden planks, that he writes these uh, GPS coordinates from the northern part of the UAE. Um, and he takes them and they go out to the sea on a boat and they start to throw these planks in, in the randomness of the sea and opening it up to, let's say, where land and sea start to come in together in a different kind of atmosphere. And this is the documentation that we see of the work. And this is a different kind of way that that same work starts to develop even further into an installation. So you have um, um, a different location of a video, um, uh, video documentation with more like natural elements of the trees, etc., that is on the top superseded, and down below the materiality of the leaves, and superimposed on top of that, you have this uh, uh, sort of like acrylic glass um, with light um, really coming out of it, um, all of these coordinates. And a different, other kind of different installation of the same idea and how they also develop in 2006. And this, a different kind of articulation. Again, this is actually, these are two-dimensional sort of paintings and they're made out of sequins. You don't, I'm, I'm sorry that the image doesn't really translate, but imagine this shimmery, <laughs> handmade, embroidered pieces that have such, uh, you know, again, this kind of bent self with, um, with all, the, all of these details. And this is, again, Muhammad trying to capture light, to create a three-dimensional, to create a, a different material kind of level of looking at painting. And this is a pro proposal for a facade of a building with, where the elevator and the directions are also, they become kind of one in their movement. And then in nature. So here we are at 2010, just in a, in a place in Philadelphia with leaves. And also in Philadelphia in a project space where he created it from just the, this, where light seeps into the narrative of the space. That's the end of uh, my presentation. I hope you were able to see with me how this language of Muhammad Qasim really is quite well developed, very uh, deserving of its own right um, to, uh, and, and has its own kind of history and uh, locale. Um, I didn't go any uh, at a lot of like the Western references, which are very important also to Muhammad, but uh, I want, wanted to give the, um, uh, a little bit of the background that is not so well versed and not so well, well spoken of. And maybe also people will start to look at Hassan's work differently when they see it at Freeze Masters or elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's um, wonderful to know a little bit of a, the history behind Muhammad's work. I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with the work, but it's more interesting, I think, to see the process behind it and how he comes up with these wonderful ideas. Um, I'll open up uh, the floor for any questions, and I'll invite Muhammad Kadhim also to take the stage. Um, if you have any questions for Muhammad or for Reem, uh, please feel free to ask. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. 
Um, I think that, that time when Hassan came back from UK, he found uh, there's uh, education which was missing in the UAE. So he started to, uh, through the workshop of the Fine Arts Society, uh, to encourage the young artists also. And he, he was providing all of us with a lot of materials, with a lot of information, historical information, through his lecture, and he's inviting other artists to, to make a workshop. Then that, uh, he continues until 2000, until 99. So then he asked me just to, again, to continue that. So I was teaching for uh, nearly 10 years. So again, it's not, the, our workshop was not only teaching them. We encouraged them to write about the art in the, and involved with the media uh, through the main supplement cultures, uh, as through the Al Khalij newspaper and others. Then, and, uh, and most of them now in the board of the Fine Arts uh, Society. And we did all this thing because uh, part of the education was missing. And in the mid of the 90s, the uh, Sharjah Academy is established, but it's, it's not enough. I found the new generation, uh, they should know also about, not about uh, making art, also about the policy of institution in the UAE, because in the United Arab Emirates, we have uh, seven emirates. Each emirates have their, uh, Beside of the Central uh, Institute, which is Ministry of Culture, we have each own authorities to have their own activities. So we can see some contradiction things sometimes happening. So I think the the, the new generation they should uh, knows about this uh, this issue. So, uh, I'm very optimistic. I think in the future they will ha will have a new generation. Um, I think Reem. Yeah, I mean, I think you're spot on to see that the lineage actually does continue forward. I mean, seeing the work of, for example, Reem al Ghaith, clearly, right? A different kind of, that installation that we saw in Venice, um, uh, Venice, the previous Venice, where you definitely saw this, the city, the environment, in an installation form that had a much more dynamic nature to it, um, uh, futuristic and, uh, you know, had a, even a generational quoting that seems very young and youthful, but does have the same, same um, uh, way of thinking that goes back to Hassan and to Muhammad Kalim. So I, I think it's very important to know that these references are there. Um, you know, they've been teaching. Um, it's a very uh, kind of dynamic scene that is interactive. Um, it's, uh, you see the references coming together. So it's nothing, nobody's, Nobody's uh, uh, inventing the wheel. There is a history that starts from before. And we'll continue. Okay, thank you everyone for coming. And again, I'd like to thank our sponsor, the Sheikh Salama bin Hamdan and Nahyan Foundation for their kind support. We are delighted and honored to be working with an institution of that caliber. Thank you for your time and your support by being here. And we look forward to seeing you in Venice in 2013. And a big hand to Reem and Muhammad. Thank you very much. Thank you.